Imagine knowing exactly what your students are learning and exactly which steps you need to take next. Join us in Download the Reading Quiz to craft meaningful and productive formative assessments that move away from gotcha moments of basic recall and toward assessing what your students actually can do. In this 30-minute free masterclass, we'll share three powerful assessment keys that work for any novel at any time of the year. Head to shop.bravenewteaching.com slash masterclass to sign up, and we'll also send you a free workbook to keep track of all your notes. Once again, that's shop.bravenewteaching.com slash masterclass to nail formative assessments forever. Well, hello, and welcome back to Brave New Teaching, and welcome, welcome to the beginning of what I hope to be first annual summer series called Camp BNT. Hi, Amanda. This could be a thing. Good morning, I, morning. I think so. I really do. I mean, if we are this, uh, you know, pat on my own back, amazing. We just have such a great lineup. And like today's episode kicks it all off. I can't even handle it with this summer author and book series. You guys, do you know how cool this is? It's so cool. And as promised a few episodes ago, you're going to get a chance to hear our first interview where we did not keep our cools. I mean, we were not cool during this interview and we're not afraid to admit it. No, we're super dorks. And it's because we were talking to number one New York Times bestselling author of historical fiction, Ruta Sepetis. And anybody who has spent a little bit of time around a bookstore and around like the ELA community, especially of like social media, right? I feel like there's different kind of iterations of an ELA teaching community. Um, You have seen Ruta's works on classroom bookshelves and in the hands of students. And my own students were so jealous that I got to virtually meet and talk to her because they were reading her novel, Salt to the Sea. And like, they were so obsessed with it. And yes. You know, and and so to kind of, if you are just jumping in and maybe you are coming here from Ruta, maybe you are following Ruta Sepetis and you were like, oh, she's on the podcast. Welcome. Uh, We are Brave New Teaching. And really the goal of this interview, there's a part one and a part two. And then, like I said, the goal is actually to get to the third episode in this kind of little lineup for us with with Miss Sepetis. Because in that third episode is where Marie and I are going to break down all of the ideas that this interview gave us and the ways we see it really shaping the classroom. And not only do we believe that stories like uh, Salt of the Sea, I Must Betray You, Fountains of Silence, not only do we believe that these belong on classroom bookshelves, but we believe that they deserve to be part of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. This is a big reason why we're so excited for the summer is because every single author and work somehow fits into the bigger perspective of what we're trying to do here at Brave New Teaching. And that is to one, challenge the status quo, and two, create classroom spaces, classroom curriculums that are more culturally responsive and fresh and responsive to students where they are and meet them there. And her book's Oh, they do that. They do that. Well, and as I started to say, she is a number one New York Times bestselling author. She writes historical fiction and is published in over 60 countries and 40 different languages. She is considered a crossover novelist as her books are read by both students and adults worldwide. Ruta Sepetis is the winner of the Carnegie Medal and renowned for giving voice to underrepresented history and those who experienced it. And that is something that we dig into in our interview with her is her process for uncovering the like hidden history and then telling its story behind the subjects of her novels. And it, it, you guys, it is so fascinating. This is where I lose my cool. Amanda loses her cool over certain things. And I lose my cool over like nerdy research stuff. I was like, you're so cool. (laughs) My little like expository reading and writing teacher brain was like, "Ah!" and then you made it into novels. I want to be you. Yeah. 
It's we so love cool. talking to her. And, and she really just, I hope that you love this interview. I hope that you have something to write with. Um, yes. And <laughs> you're going to want to take notes. You're also going to want to make sure that you head to the show notes so that you can be part of our Brave New Teaching Camp BNT because we are taking this conversation all, I mean, okay, there isn't a conversation, right? Now there's a conversation between you and your head and your steering wheel or your you know, running shoes. We want to give you the chance to actually talk to other people Mm -hmm. about all the ideas and the things that start to percolate during these interviews. So make sure that you, yes, take your notes, but also head to the show notes and become a member of our free kind of Facebook community where we're chatting all summer long about these books and ideas. Even if you haven't read a book yet, Yes. You're going to have ideas from yeah, these interviews. It's basically, we want you to join our summer book club. Like, come and join us. Have the conversations. We are also organizing some, like, conversations with the authors and you all, our listeners, seeing where we can get that sort of stuff orchestrated. We will be back again next week with the other half of this episode. So don't worry, I'll be coming at you with even more of Ruta Sepetis' accolades and just amazing accomplishments. But for now, I think it is time for us to jump into the first half of this interview. You're going to fall in love with her if you haven't already, just like we did. So I think it's time. Let's cue the music. You're listening to Brave New Teaching, and we are so much more than a podcast. We give teachers the inspiration, support, and tools to challenge the status quo. I'm Amanda, and I'm a former English teacher from Illinois. And I'm Marie, and I'm a teacher from Southern California. Join us at bravenewteaching.com to find out more about our courses, festivals, and get every episode's show notes. We're so glad you're here. Enjoy the show. All right, everybody. We could not be more pleased to have our guest here today. You heard all about her in the intro. She is amazing. And I guarantee if you take a quick glance around your library at school, your classroom library, you are bound to find at least two of her titles. Please welcome to the Brave New Teaching Podcast, author Ruta Sepetis. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Oh my gosh, we are so thrilled that you're here. Everyone in the listening audience knows we've been oogling over your books for book clubs, for whole class novels for such a long time. And we're just so excited for everyone to get to hear from you about the process and about all the wonderful things that you have done as an author. We're so thrilled. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. Let's peel back all the layers. Oh, I'm all in. I mean, like what could be cooler when you're a couple of English teachers <laughs> who talk ad nauseum about books and reading and reading skills and teaching students how to think and talk about what they're reading. But like, what could be cooler than to talk to someone who creates the stuff that we are bringing into our classrooms for them to read? Like, it's this meta amazing moment that we're having right now. Very no, cool. it's, it's mutually amazing because I highly doubt that a student runs into a classroom asking for a book about a Lithuanian girl starving in Siberia. <laughs> so I think this, you You'd know, be surprised. <laughs> oh, good. I love hearing that. That's great. But then once they're in, they're in, they're sucked yes. in. They yes. can't help it. Yes. But it's thanks to you that the readers get sucked in. And I don't take that for granted. <sighs> All right. We have got listeners. We have a kind of a a lofty list of questions, shall I say, ambitious list of questions that we are going to start chipping away at. As you said, we're going to peel back the layers. Um, So I'm just going to jump into the first one. Or Amanda, do you want to jump into the first one? I want to open this up. Well, sure. Yeah. I mean, the first thing I thought of when I was like, we get a chance to talk to Ruta Sepetis. I want to hear her read her own work. And I know those of you all who practice First Chapter Friday, this just might be the perfect thing for you to play for your students and get them hooked is hearing the author in her own words, sharing her story. So Ruta, would you be willing to delight us with a little clip of your first chapter? I would love to. I am going to read the first chapter of my latest novel, I Must Betray You, which follows a 17-year-old high school kid who is blackmailed by the secret police to become an informer. And he decides to turn the tables and everything goes, of course, you know, very wrong. (laughs) Um, So it's a, it's a, it's a historical thriller. And I'm going to read the, 
the first uh, chapter, which is a whole page. If you know my books, you know my <laughs> chapter, two pages. All right, so here we go. They lived in darkness, breathing shadows. Hands plunged deep within their pockets, hiding frozen fingers balled into fists. They avoided the eyes of others. To look into the face of fear brought risk of getting trapped in its undertow. But somehow, invisible eyes, they were forever upon them, even in the darkest darkness. Watching, always watching. Romania's perpetual sense of surveillance. That's how it's been described, the burden of a secret storm. This is not recited from memory. There was a student, a young man in the capital city of Bucharest. He wrote it all down, and then he feared it was a mistake. We speak of mistakes. Some believe that Dracula is the most frightening character associated with Romania. When they learn the truth, will it haunt them? Dracula is fiction with no real connection to Romanian history. But there was once a real bloodthirsty monster living in a castle in Romania. He remained in his tower for 24 years. While Dracula chose specific victims, this other monster chose to be evil and cruel to everyone. He denied them food, electricity, truth, and freedom. The citizens of Romania were stoic and resilient, but they suffered a terror of tyranny. How many, you ask? 23 million people. Names in history largely unknown. Then, a metal box found next to a grave. Inside was a manuscript. And this is how one boy told the story. Cliffhanger. <laughs> what else is in the box? How does he tell the story? Why don't we know this story? <laughs> that is flying off uh -huh. classroom library shelves uh -huh. right yep. now. That one. Yep. Yep. Better have a few <laughs> copies, everybody. <laughs> yep. It's checked out. Consider it checked out. This episode is brought to you by Curriculum Rehab by us, the team here at Brave New Teaching. It is the first and only teacher PD of its kind, a course to help teachers like you by guiding you through creating your own personal framework for curriculum. You make it work for you, your students, and your unique situation because nobody else knows what the kiddos in your classroom need the way that you do. Curriculum Rehab takes all of the resources available to you, all of the lessons, the assessments, the activities, Activities, all of the texts, everything that could possibly be there for you, and it helps you organize what you actually need in order to attain your teaching objectives. These are the strategies that Amanda and myself have used in our own classrooms, have developed over very long years of teaching and figuring things out combined together to create this framework and these strategies that we can guide you through. This course will give you the tools you need for a complete curriculum overhaul or to start from scratch. Wherever you are on that continuum, it does it all for you and with you on your timeline. So start today, do a little bit more in a couple of months, and then pick it up next summer. It's Teacher PD the way it should be on your own time. Head to curriculumrehab.com slash course for more information, or just head to the show notes for this episode. We cannot wait to see you there. It's finally time to take control of what goes on in your own classroom and create the curriculum of your dreams. All right, let's get back into the show. So I have to tell you, as a little girl, I always wanted to do what you do. Like I, we have pictures of me and all of my little like notebooks of when I was little writing stories about the fictional kitten that I never owned because I'm allergic and my little sister and they were always like starring and I wanted to be an author and you know, life happens and it takes its turns. And here I am instead of writing literature, teaching kids and like, and just consuming as many books as I possibly can. And so I'm so in awe that this is, I mean, yes, it's a work and it's a trade, but it's a craft, right? And so how did your journey as a writer begin? What keeps you going along that journey? And I'm sure that it is a long story, but like, what would you be willing to share about your journey as a writer? Well, first I'll share that it sounds like we were the same little kid because <laughs> I was sitting around with my scratch and sniff notebooks, writing yes. you know, novels. And 
I blame Roald Dahl and James and the Giant Peach. And here's why. I read that book and that book made the world less lonely for me. Mm. First of all, the this here's this little boy who's subject to some unsavory adults and but he finds his way and he finds friends and Roald Dahl was really irreverent with his humor and and was so funny. And so in third grade, when my teacher, Mrs. Zimmer, gave an assignment that we could embark upon a creative project, I decided that I was going to write the next great American novel. That's and fantastic. Thanks, yes. Yes. And thanks to Roald Dahl, I had, you know, a kind of this thought of what I wanted. And I called the book The Adventures of Betsy. And it was irreverent. Uh, in fact, it was so irreverent that one of my friends took it home because she loved it and her parents did not love it. And the parents <laughs> called the other parents and the adventures of Betsy, um, the, the parents really objected to this book and it became such an enduring drama in third grade that it stole my courage and I was too fearful oh. and I didn't write another story for 20 years, but that I is always got it. It, 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 when I think back on it, um, and if I wish someone would have said, oh, wow, there must really be something in this. If, if you know, right, if, right. You, if you have a banned book in third grade, I was just gonna say, like, flash on. forward to 2022, 2023, I mean, when all the good books, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. And had so, you only known you were prolific, yeah, exactly. And so, <laughs> I like I said, it stole my courage, I became fearful, and instead of pursuing writing, I pursued writing but for other people and with other people. And I spent 22 years working in the music business um, in Los Angeles, working with songwriters, uh, helping them tell their stories through song, working with bands and music producers and video game composers. So I was working in story, but they weren't my own stories. So, sure. and then after many moons, um, I finally found my way back to my first love, which was writing. And that came through a snarky musician. I had been working with musicians so long and I had learned that if they put a piece of their own story into their song, it was more resonant. It was more mm. authentic. It was much more likely to become successful. So I was asking them, you know, what's your story? What's your story? Share a bit about yourself, you know, in this project. And one day they turned the tables and said, all right, Sapetis, what's your story? And I said, oh, my story, I'm Lithuanian. And they had no idea what that was. The singer, right. of, the, the singer of the band said, I'm so sorry. How long have you had that, Ruta? And I thought, oh, what? My <laughs> oh, my gosh. And, but, but, then, but then the band members, they said, Does it no. hurt? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. Is it scaly? Is there a cream for that? Yeah. Is, it, is, there an, is there an ointment for that? Exactly. Or, yeah. And, but, but they challenged me and said, no, we don't accept that. We don't, with all due respect, we don't know what that means to be Lithuanian. <laughs> what does that mean? And that snarky musician kind of set me on the path. And I wrote uh, what became Between Shades of Grey. And uh, after I published my first two books, my publisher came to me and said, we know what you're doing. You're, you know, moonlighting on American Idol and these shows and you're working with these musicians. We want you to quit that. And here I am. Oh, wow. And you took the step into your own business, your own thing outside of somebody else. That's amazing. And amazing and also kind of a white knuckled ride. Think about uh, yeah. this. So I, I spent 22 years building this um, business where I was helping and managing songwriters and musicians. And I'm going to chuck that to write <laughs> books about totalitarianism for teens. <laughs> And, and you know what? It worked out. It absolutely worked out. Thanks to teachers and librarians and reading specialists who are really the hidden heroes here, you know, bringing my books, you know, out of the dark. <laughs> well, we, I mean, we are really, I will say we are really good at sniffing out what a kid, and when I say a kid, I mean a ninth through 12th grader, but like my bread and butter is like 11th and 12th. I am really good. And so are our contemporaries at sniffing out something that a kid is going to connect with. And that is exactly what we all recognize in what in you work. create. Okay. Yeah. And it does, it takes a certain eye. It takes a certain experience to really be able to do that and to like 
curate, but like time and time again, you're able to recreate those situations and stories and characters that kids can really connect with. Well, and I'm I'm actually really curious about the process that you went through, Ruta, and in was it a direct decision, right, of choosing your audience, right? You have this story, you did so much research, especially with Between Shades of Grey and kind of moving forward. Could you tell us a little bit about that decision to tackle your stories for a young adult audience? And maybe what went into that decision, or was it just accidental? I mean, I think it's really impressive and so important for these kids, but I, I wonder what it was like for you. It was not accidental. Absolutely not. Uh, I consider myself um, a novelist for young adults. And although my books in several countries are published for adults in Italy, for example, they will not publish my books for students or young adults. Huh. I think they're too heavy and, 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 you know, um, dark, in I guess. Italy. Yes. <laughs> really? Of yes. all places. I don't in know. I just th- think of the history within that country. I and know. that's too heavy? Well, it's too heavy to burden the youth uh, with, they said. Okay. But, but so in Italy, I'm considered a historical romance novelist. Oh. <laughs> Go okay. figure. Make but it. no, this, a lot of people when I'm in interviews, they actually think it's the opposite. They say, so really, you are, you intended to write for adults, but your, your uh, books just made their way to students. No, I absolutely wanted to become a writer for and to work for young adults, to work with young adults. And why? Well, for, for inspiration, I think that young readers, as you mentioned, you know, they're deep thinkers and they're deep feelers. They're probably one of the most honest reading audiences that, <laughs> that exists, right? Uh, and yep. so I, I wanted to bring these fading pieces of history to these deep thinkers and deep feelers who are going to carry these stories into the future and also to maybe, if, if I'm lucky, maybe the books might provide some context or inspiration um, that young readers can discover the incredible personal power of young adults their age um, through history and adversity. Teens who have endured Siberian death camps, sinking ships, revolutions, and through it all, they discovered strength through struggle or Maybe the notion that sometimes amidst the worst, we have a chance to reveal our best. Like to me, that's so inspiring. And I get that inspiration from young people. And so I want to give it back to young people, if that makes sense. I think it's working. And I I got chills because I can't, I also can't even imagine like how serendipitous it is that your books are being published in a present day era that needs that so badly. Not only do our age range of students need more engaging work, but engaging work that connects them to young people who have endured the kinds of hardships that they've never even heard of. I just find that the way that that's converged is just so powerful beyond belief. Uh, But it's powerful for me as well to see how knowledge of the past gives context to the present, how the story in Between Shades of Grey, someone might read that and that might provide context for what's happening in Ukraine. And, yeah. um, you know, so yeah, the, it's those observations are, are always there. I think like, because I feel like such an advocate for my students and mm-hmm. um, I've talked on the podcast as we're recording, it's still, it's the very end of 2022, but even going into this next year where this school year has been an odd one because I have in my classroom, I have all seniors and they are all the kids that their freshman year was cut short by quarantine from COVID. So they were taken out and then they spent sophomore year learning online. Junior year was back in person for most kids, but it's still odd. And this year it's just been a very long haul to, to like, just get in the game. It's just been, it's been odd. There's more I can say, but it's been odd. And just to hear and to see the weight of the world on their shoulders, but they don't know how to grapple with it. And they don't quite frankly feel like they belong in the conversation because they've been kind of dismissed as kids by us, by like, uh, by us, I mean, like the, the grownups around all parts Collect- of their life. Collectively, yes. Collectively. And to hear you, an established author and artist, 
putting out work that is meant for them, that includes them in the conversation, and that creates space for them to be part of the world at large, looking at a huge trajectory of history and looking at society then and reflected now. And it's created for them. It's so inclusive and it's just amazing to hear and like how empowering for students to be like, hey, guess what? Just because you're by age an adult doesn't necessarily mean you're an adult, but I'd like to give you something that helps you become one. And like, oh, and not only that, I think as you guys know, sometimes the student is the teacher. And Absolutely. when they, they bring it, when they bring an author in for an event or often it's positioned as, oh, well, the students are going to learn from the author. Trust me, the author <laughs> learns from the students. I, I know I do. And I really believe in this reverse mentorship. People often think that a mentor or a teacher has to be someone who is older and, and with different experience or even just by virtue of their age. But often I find that some of the most illuminating and educational conversations come when you put older people together with younger people and truly listen to what the young people have to say, even down to some of them, you know, say, wow, Ruta, you really need a stylist. Like you don't look old, but you dress old, you know? <laughs> yeah. That, that brutal is, honesty, man. Is that it's, frank it's wisdom? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We always like talk about how you have to have guts to do things for and with kids, specifically teenagers, because like talk about the most judgmental just by default, like they are steeped in hormones. The most judgmental section of society is like 14 to 18. <laughs> okay, I have, I have a related sort of related question. So, okay. Track with me here. So my next curiosity, like I'm dying to know this. So I'm also real. I know that this is partly I've, I've watched a lot of YouTube videos about you, Ruta. So I probably know more than you're comfortable with, but um, <laughs> I, I know that a lot of the reason that you went in the historical fiction genre was connecting with your own history and things like that. So I kind of already think most people know the first part of this question, but I'm curious again about your choice to go the route of historical fiction of all the things you could write for young people. You know, what is it about historical fiction that so draw, you know, draws you? And then I'd also be curious to know in the same vein, how much historical fiction you remember reading when you were in high school and you were in middle school and if it was a genre that intrigued you then or was even presented to you in your school experience. Because I think, you know, from what I've taught, it, the answer right now is very little. The, historical fiction is not a genre prioritized in the 612 lane. I, I, I say it exists, but it's not a priority. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Ruto, and see what you think about, about all that. Well, I have found that over the past, let's say, 12 years, historical fiction has gained momentum. When I began, uh, Between Shades of Grey was released in 2011, and I went to a conference, my first, you know, educational conference, you know, for teachers of young adult literature. And I had my galleys of Between Shades of Grey, and a woman came by, and she said, Oh, what's the book? And I said, Oh, Between Shades of Grey. And this was, thank goodness, before Fifty Shades came out. Can you imagine me trying to like right. hustle and peddle a Shades of Grey at an educational conference? And, uh, and the woman stopped and she said, What genre is it? And I said, Oh, it's historical fiction. And she literally took a step back and put her hands up, you know, almost like surrendering. And she said, Oh, Oh no, that, that just doesn't work for us. I said, <laughs> Oh my I said, word. And I said, Very why big not? Reaction. <laughs> yes. Oh, and you got, I had, I had my pen at the ready. I was going to sign a galley for, she right. was so not interested. And I said, why doesn't it work for you? And she said, well, I'm going to explain it like this. She said, which might sound insensitive. She said, um, in schools, <laughs> historical fiction is the ugly girl at the dance. Oh, and wow. I, I said, wow. I mean, literally, I said, wow. I said, that's a lot. Let, let me think on that. And all it was, all, I felt like condemned before the book was even released. And, you know, there I was, so pen poised to sign yeah. up. And it didn't happen. And, but now over the years, I have found, again, thanks to teachers who are bringing it into the classroom, that when done well, historical fiction is such an elastic genre. You can have a historical fantasy. You can have a historical romance. You can have a historical thriller, you know. And so there is a lot there. And so I do find now that um, historical is doing much better than, let's say, it was 12 years ago. 
Now, when I, to your other question about, um, you know, going in school, no. But first, I will have to say, like, this was totally my preference. I told you I loved Roald Dahl. I loved anything that was quirky. Um, mm-hmm. and, and also, I really, you know, if it had kissing, I was, I was in. I was all in. Oh, 100%. <laughs> yes. Sign I mean, so, me up as well. Yeah. Totally. So laughter and kissing, you know, really, uh, you know, doesn't, there weren't a lot of historical novels then that were, you know, where people were making out in, you know, <laughs> um, over history. I don't know. But uh, so, no, I wasn't as uh, interested in it. So then why? How in the world do I <laughs> not only end up writing historical fiction, but writing for that age that I was when all I wanted was, you know, drama and, and kissing because I found that it is not a trope. It is not a cliche that in history, particularly uh, during times of adversity and hardship, young people form everlasting bonds. And when I interview these true witnesses, more than the terror, more than the horror, they remember the hope and they remember that love. So that has that love, but then even bigger than that. Okay. So why am I doing this? Because I really believe, and some people have heard me say this, that sharing of story and history, it facilitates human understanding. My own father for many years was misunderstood. Um, you know, that in his neighborhood, he didn't go to the fireworks on 4th of July. And this, you know, people started saying, oh, he's unpatriotic. And once my dad shared his story, that he was a survivor of World War II, that he fled from Lithuania, that he spent nine years in refugee camp. And when he was in the camp, the camp was bombed. And on 4th of July, those fireworks remind him of the war and brings back this fear for him. Once his neighbors learned that story and the history, the atmosphere around my father went from criticism to compassion just because they knew his story. And that is so powerful to me. If we can share these underrepresented pieces uh, of history, could we make true progress and facilitate human understanding and bridge those widths between us, you know, that those awful widths that stand between us, which when we really get down to it, they're not as wide as we think or feel. So that's, you know, part of the, of the reasoning. And I realized that this genre that might not be uh, as as hot and sexy as, as other ones, I really think has the potential to make tremendous impact. Oh, absolutely. That's absolutely, that's so beautiful. The way that you just described Sorry, I'm all totally of that. Ranting. Because, no, not at all. Uh, no. it's, <laughs> it's the idea. Well, because we always Memorize. talk about how reading is an, what's the quote? Read is, reading is an exercise in empathy. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a very famous quote that I'm completely lacking in who said it. Mm, I don't remember. But that idea of that's why we bring stories into our classrooms. That's why we teach history in general. Right. But like as yes. a kid, I remember having a really hard time connecting with a lot of different pieces of history because it felt so clinical. So why wouldn't historical fiction Makes sense, right? We connect with stories, we connect with characters and relationships, and all that historical fiction does, not all that, but like what it does and what's an amazing vehicle is for that bringing to life of the history and the reason that we teach history in the first place, everything that you've just described. I have a really good problem with the teacher that was mean to you. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I have a big problem. I want to find her and talk to her about that. I actually, I don't, I didn't perceive it as being mean, but I thought it was like, I do have to say that I appreciated it because I really wasn't aware of the mountain that I had chosen to climb yeah. at, at the time. I, yeah. I really wasn't aware. And, and if I, if I would have been able to say, Hey, listen, you know, I think feelings stay with us longer than facts. And what if we can take these historical facts and make a statistic a human being through historical fiction? She probably would have walked away anyway. But <laughs> right, exactly. as your self-appointed bodyguards, we would have just handled her however you wanted. So 
Take care. We could have brought her back when you were ready to talk to her. That would have been. And a lot of what we talk about with teaching philosophy, even just on this podcast, is about our little tagline, challenging the status quo and looking at just because we have been doing the same things, you know, quote unquote, doing the same things because they are traditionally in an English language arts classroom or whatever for so long, like, does that mean that they're right? Does that mean that they're serving today's kids? Is does the, it, What does that mean? Let's take a critical eye. And so hearing you talk about the way you write and what you create just reaffirms that in such a beautiful way. Oh, thank you. Friends, thank you so much for joining us for the first half of this interview. Like we said, we, um, you know, we fangirl. We, uh, we lose our cool. Like, what can we say? <laughs> Even We're listening back to it. It's like, wow. We did that? Yeah, that was that was pretty cool. That was over winter break, wasn't it, too? That was a while ago. Like, yeah, it was a while ago. That we were getting that one uh, taken care of. And we were so grateful for just the time that Ruta spent with us and how generous she is with her time, with her process, and just talking about her craft and... And how supportive she is of teachers. And I can't wait actually for everybody to hear the second half because we start getting into even more about her take on education, her take on the fit of books in a classroom, of historical fiction in the classroom. And like just it sets us up so well to talk more about real world classroom applications for all of the things we're talking about. I am actually looking forward to hearing everyone's reactions because one of the questions that we ask her in the next part of the interview is if someone listening is about to pick up one of your books, what do you hope they walk away with by the last page? And I remember like putting her on the spot. We, we sent the questions to her ahead of time, but she said that she didn't look at them because she really wanted to be candid and, you know, like really honest Uh with us in the moment. And that's a, I think that's a big question to ask her on the spot. And I loved, loved her answer. Answer. So I'm excited. I even poked her a little bit about essential questions, you guys. So uh, yeah. So talk about getting theme and essential question from the actual artist herself. And then we asked her a little question about what is like one thing that you would change about education. And whenever we talk to people who are, I mean, she's kind of got like a toe in the water of education because she's like, in the academic world and that she's like such a acclaimed researcher and she's obviously highly academically skilled, but like she doesn't work as a professional educator. And so her take on education uh, might surprise you. It might, but no matter what, we want to keep talking to you all about your ideas, what you're thinking about, you know, how you can involve um, Ruta's work in your classroom. Please take a chance to head over to bravenewteaching.com slash camp and jump in to Camp BNT with us. Yes, grab your s'mores and your bug spray, unless you want to sit inside like a hermit like me, and then you can just, there you go. All right, friends, we will see you next week. We cannot wait for more fun with Rudis Petties and the rest of Camp BNT. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks again for listening to Brave New Teaching. We'd love to keep the conversation going over on Instagram. And while you're there, check out the links in our bio for the most up-to-date events going on in the Brave New Teaching community. Thanks for being here and have a great week at school. 